Welcome, Margaret, to the Collaborative Research Center, Origin and Function of Meta-Organisms. Thank you so much for coming once more, being our guest, uh, being a supporter, advisor. Um, it's actually time, it's uh, exactly nearly 10 years after publication of a major paper, which probably got the whole field of host microbe uh, interaction research really going. And uh, you gathered at that time a bunch of different uh, people and the outcome was a paper which is now cited, uh, I guess, nearly 2,000 times. What happened at that time when you invited us to that remote place in Durham, uh, National Synthesis Evolutionary Center, and what got the ball rolling? Well, what I, I was privileged to have a Guggenheim Foundation grant, um, and one of the, what I had proposed to do was to, to think about um, this new revolution in biology with microbes being foundational. And it was very clear that this was a very difficult situation because uh, biology had been so very siloed since the 1950s. So I decided to bring together a group of people, and there were 25 uh, scientists and Mike Hadfield and myself. And we, they were in the fields of, of the origin of life and the evolution, origin and evolution of life, um, genomics, developmental biology, uh, physiology, and ecology. And it was a very unusual meeting because for, for uh, a series of days, uh, each of these uh, five, there were 25 people uh, in five groups, and each of the five groups, uh, they, we divided into five, and went into a different room each day, and were to consider uh, how microbes were going to, in, the, the understanding that microbes are foundational was going to influence their field. And so um, what we did was we went into these rooms for several days and the, the job was to come out with 700 words and a figure <laughs> for a paper that we would go forward with. So um, it was quite an adventure. At the end of each day, we would get together and, and discuss what had gone on in our individual groups. But it was uh, an unusual meeting, and uh, so at the end of that meeting, we got those from each group, we got those 700 words uh, and a figure, and then with the groups, uh, we began to massage what had gone on to try to put it into one voice. And then we put it into one voice, and we went to Science Magazine with it, and Science Magazine um, sat on it for a while, and. Uh, and I kept going back to them and saying, where is it and where is it? And uh, finally, um, I got permission from the group because science was not moving on it. I got permission from the group to pull it from science. And we actually, at that point, it was already accepted. But they were continuing not to make progress with the publication. And I really thought that it was important to come out. So we then went to Nature and we got three reviews, two really good ones and one not so favorable. And Nature has a rule that they all three have to be perfect uh, reviews. And so um, we went to PNAS. And PNAS immediately accepted the, the, the article that we wrote and we put it out there. And um, I was very happy that we had we had a product from what we had done. It was a fantastic meeting. And um, it just was a place where we had to say, it for the, you know, one of the first times was that, that animals live in a microbial world. And the, since 2006, 2008, with, the, with next gen sequencing coming on, on board, we became aware that microbes are the most diverse organisms on Earth, and they are the base of health of everything. Mm -hmm. And it was very clear that that was a world we couldn't know, mm -hmm. and we had to change the way we thought. And so it was the biggest change in our biosphere since Darwin, mm -hmm. and we had to come to grips with that. And mm -hmm. so I feel very privileged to have interacted with those people and put that paper uh, to press. So in essence, at the time, I think, uh you brought people from very different disciplines together in a remote place 
um, you locked them uh, for several days <laughs> yes. in independent rooms and then yes. um, you came out with, uh, with that paper and independent from the political issue of then where it got published. Right. Uh, from that time on, and uh, you continuously talk about that, you talk about teaching a new biology. Uh, what do you mean with that? So since we now know that microbes are foundational, um, you can teach an introductory biology course, for instance, with um, integrating macro and microbiology. And when you do that, it is incredibly unifying to the field. So what it is able to answer is, given the palette of the physical and chemical world that, that animals and plants are exposed to, what is it that they do uh, with that palette? And microorganisms do a much wider variety of things than animals and plants do. And so now we know that there are two to three domains of life. One domain is entirely microbial, and the other one is principally microbial, but a portion of which is animals and plants. <coughs> and, and animals and plants only do very, uh, they're, they're they're telescoped into a very specific set of chemical reactions in just based on constraints on who they are and what they do. Whereas microbes are very broad in what they do. So you can start a, a, a topic in biology, um, and the example that I often give is behavior. So in microbes, a behavior um, is uh, the, the microbe is very small and it's all biochemical and they sense something on the, let's say they're going to chemotax towards something, they sense something on the front end and then they have an integration of the information that they receive from the environment just so that they integrate with their past history and they make the right response, so they integrate the information and then there's an effector on the other end and that is in the case of a microbe, usually a flagellum, that causes it to move in a particular direction toward something that's good or away for some, from something that's bad. Well, then you know, then you can you get to an, you get to animals, and you say, by the way, there are three kinds of neurons: there are sensory neurons, inner neurons, and motor neurons. And so, there's nothing new under the sun. What organisms have to do is they have to sense the environment, integrate that into their history and their biology, and then they have to respond appropriately. And so that's, that's just one example. Now one of the things that's really unifying about considering microbes as foundational and beginning every lecture with how microbes do it is that um, they collapse the hierarchy of life. And so instead of having, so you go from molecule to ecosystems, but in animals and plants, you have this intervening, intervening above the cell, tissues, organs, organ systems. And so the microbes collapse that hierarchy such that the cell is the organism, and then they go directly to population, community, and ecosystem. What that does is, it, in collapsing the hierarchy, is it allows you to recognize that in a microbe, their behavior, their ecology, their physiology and whatnot is their biochemistry and molecular biology. And so you can work out from there. So it's an incredibly unifying um, uh, construct. Mm -hmm. If you can do that and you start every topic with the microbial world and then you work your way up into what happens when you have a, a, a nucleus and then you, you are, are an animal or a plant, multicellular organism, what do you do? And so it's a derivative. Mm -hmm. Animals and plants are derivatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So this new teaching and the recognition of animals in a microbial world mm -hmm. uh, led to this emerging new field and led to our collaborative research center, meta organisms research, etc. Now being able to travel again and to go to conferences, um, I recently I returned back with mixed feelings. Being on conferences where this is recognized and uh, is actually also um, expanded and uh, people add to it, 
But there's also evolution of cancer meetings or meetings on biodiversity, where you sit for several days and microbes are not mentioned a single time. And then you start to wonder, why that? Are these people just ignorant or do they not consider the role of the microbes and the 3.5 billion years of history of microbial life on Earth as relevant? Uh, what do you think? Yeah. Why, there, why is there... There's, I feel still a lot of, of hesitation and uh, reluctance to accept your new concepts. Yeah, I think uh, people Cancer, by nature... biodiversity, yeah. Yeah, people by nature don't like change. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so, so one of the problems is beginning in 1953 with the discovery of DNA as the genetic material, um, biology, and that was established by physical chemists, basically. And, and they came into the field, and biology went down into deep silos. You were a molecular biologist, you're a cell biologist, you're a physiologist, you're a um, population biologist, you're an ecologist, or you're um, an evolutionary biologist. And those deep silos are reflected in the nature of departments and the nature of funding agencies and so on and so forth. And people were trained in that way. People in our generation were trained in that way. And so what has happened is they, they're ill-equipped to, to, be, to, to step back and look at, at the whole picture. And so um, what's encouraging to me is that um, junior, jun the junior people are being trained more broadly. And it's very exciting. I mean, this is the best time to be in biology that I can imagine. I mean, it's just a very exciting field, lots of new things happening. But one of the problems is, still to this day, the senior people um, rule the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's their viewpoint and their, their um, narrow view of, the, of things is, is what is, is keeping, you know, and, and they, they have a great deal of difficulty making this leap. Part of the other, the other problem is that um, microbiology has been vulcanized away from, from animal and plant biology since the 19th century. And so people will get degrees in microbiology um, without having any animal and plant biology, and people will get degrees in animal and plant biology everywhere from ecosystems to cell biology and molecular biology with a single lecture on the microbial world in their freshman year of college, you know, in their first year of college. And so there's this lack of view, of comprehensive view of the biosphere that, that we are lacking. And it has to do largely with the failure of our educational system at this point. It really, really requires that we, we remodel our educational system. And I think that will be the solution. Yeah, um, let, let's um, deepen there a little bit and go to the bright side, not the senior people, but the junior generation, which is uh, at the moment here, graduate students or postdocs, and training them. And I think, uh, I fully agree, I think this is really a challenge uh, because uh, the field is interdisciplinary, the field is at the frontier. Um, any ideas about um, components of a good training system? Yeah, I, I think that... Um, having them take, whenever possible, um, biology courses that include, you know, a, a broader view. And I am not in favor of people um, deciding that they're going to be an, in a narrow major at this point, like molecular biology or ecology or something like that. They, they really need to, to, to search out uh, situations in which they can be more, more broadly trained if that's possible. Can the senior generation do something in that direction? I think, I think that we should be developing those. I mean, it's, it's in our best interest to develop those um, curricula in order for them. So I, th I think that you could, and well. I mean, we have here in Europe, yeah. we have the SUMNET, which is, goes yeah. in this direction, yeah. which is a European 
training network which allows people to move from one European institution to another in institution and to work with colleagues uh, yeah. at a graduate postdoc level. Yeah. And, uh, so that's maybe a start and which one yeah. maybe should expand uh, I think, also to the states. And to yeah, well, and I think to undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you can take an introductory biology course mm -hmm. that takes you by start, the starting point of every topic being the microbial world all the way up to um, um, animals and plants. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, to teach students the history of the biosphere and that's, as you said, microbial for, for a very long time. The history of the biosphere, the evolution of the biosphere, the molecular basis for evolution, and persistence in the environment, you know, all the things that are required, developmental biology, physiology, and so on, up through population biology um, and ecosystems biology. Mm -hmm. You can do that. So one of the failures of biology, in my opinion, is that it has been not unified, it is bricolage, unlike chemistry and physics. So chemistry and physics textbooks that I had when I was a kid um, quite a while ago um, are, have the same, the, the textbooks mm -hmm. of that field mm -hmm. today have mm -hmm. the same big table of contents mm -hmm. as they did back then. Mm -hmm. And biology has never achieved that, mm -hmm. but I think we're there now. And mm -hmm. it's our challenge to make that happen. I think that we can teach biology based on, you know, basic principles mm -hmm. of the field, mm -hmm. and I think that that that's where we are. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of our of our short uh, chat on, on on perspectives of microorganism research, um, I mean the the uh, biology and the life sciences are in just an incredible change now you and we are we are writing constantly article on article on rethinking the immune system rethinking the nervous system and there are a lot of rethinkings at the moment now recently you got appointed to a very uh, prestigious and uh, influential position as uh, the director of a new carnegie life science institute um, what's your vision of the life sciences for the next 10 and 20 years yeah so so it's, it's all about being at the frontier and the forefront of this major revolution in biology. And Carnegie has always been and has always prided itself on being at the frontier. They're pioneering research. They're not unlike a Max Planck. In other words, they, they have a lot of, of support, financial support that is given to them to, to push fields forward. And they are the absolute um, exceptional um, scientists that are at the Carnegie. And what I'm excited about is the, the collaboration between Carnegie and Caltech, California Institute of Technology. And the reason why that's so exciting is both of them are small. Both of them are small institutions of very high quality, and both of them are very dedicated to this aim. And that is, 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 um, revolutionizing biology to recognize microbiology as foundational. And so my excitement is to have the opportunity to lead those, those researchers in this, in this endeavor. I think, um, I think biology is, is a, a very exciting place to be right now. And, and we just have to, have to try um, again and again and again. I mean, this is, this is not, a, change is not easy. And, but it's, you know, when people ask me, people will say, ah, the microbiome is a fad. And I'll, I'll, I always look at them and say, it's the way the biological world works. It's not a fad. Yeah. Thank you so much, Margaret. Uh, we wish you um, good luck and very best wishes for the responsibility you have taken over. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Thomas.